Welcome everybody uh, uh, at home and here in the classroom. So this is the third edition of our autumn cycle um, of uh, seminars in digital and public humanities. And it, this is in connection with the introduction to digital and public humanities of our master program in digital and public humanities. And uh, I'm very pleased to have Nicolo Delunto today as a, as a guest presenter here in the seminar. I will introduce uh, you to the audience uh, shortly. Uh, first, a uh, couple of uh, instructions. Uh, so this is being recorded and will be also uploaded um, online on our YouTube channel soon. So uh, uh, Elena um, Alessandra uh, has just uploaded the seminar from two weeks ago from Ray Siemens and Alissa Arbuckle. So uh, very uh, viewable. Uh, and um, um, we will have a 45 minutes presentation from, from Nicolo. And you can also, while... Uh, while uh, doing the presentation, uh, put your comments and questions into the chat. And after the um, presentation, there will be some prepared questions from the students here in the classroom and at home. So students are uh, participating in different ways here. Uh, generally, uh, that's our teaching arrangement in Kafoskari at the moment. Um, and I will give you room then to ask your questions yourself, or in, in case you uh, want me to read it, I can read it also from, from the chat. Um, this uh, seminar, this special seminar for uh, dedicated to digital archaeology, is uh, also co-organized by the uh, Centro Studi Archaeologia Venezia, the CISVE, uh, and the director and my colleague uh, from uh, medieval archaeology, Sauro Geriki, has a problem with the connection. So unfortunately, he was um, uh, to uh, say uh, some nice greetings, but uh, I hope he will be able to join us uh, shortly. And maybe he can also um, greet everyone goodbye at the end of the of the seminar. So uh, yeah, let's let's see. Uh, I hope the technology will uh, work fine. Last time we had some problems here in the classroom. It's always a, a bit uh, not uh, cl clearly foreseeable what what happens, but it should should work fine. Um, other instructions? I don't think so. Uh, Stefano Delaglio, thank you uh, for his uh, organ for the organization of this series. He is not able to participate heute, uh, heute today. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, yeah, I'm now very pleased to introduce you to Nicolo Delunto, uh, associate professor uh, at Lund University. Uh, he studied archaeology at the University of Rome, La Sapienza, and uh, at the CNR Institute for Technologies Applied to Cultural Heritage. He took uh, the very early stage of part in projects for 3D documentation and visualization uh, before obtaining uh, a PhD in technologies and management of cultural heritage at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Lucca in Italy. Uh, before taking up a position in uh, Lund, he worked as a postdoc and lecturer at the University of California, Merced. And uh, since August uh, 2019, he is a visiting professor. So you are still a visiting professor in, uh, at the Department of uh, Collection Management at the Museum of Cultural History, uh, University of Oslo. Is this still valid? OK. <laughs> so, and uh, Nicolo will uh, talk today about producing knowledge in the virtual space, approaching archaeological uh, archaeological data. So thank you very much for uh, being here with us and we look forward to an exciting presentation. I put myself on mute and will interrupt you and some, uh, if something happens. So let's see how, how it goes. Well, thank you very much for this kind uh, introduction, Franz, and thank you for having me here. It's been uh, it's a great honor. And uh, today um, I prepare a presentation which, is, which I'm going to share in a second. Um, which address um, not um, only, let's say, um, 
uh, there it is. Is it visible, right? I hope, uh, yeah, I hope it's visible. Um, which is address specific aspect of virtual, uh, of virtual reality in archaeology. So um, now the title I know is a little bit long and strange, but uh, in reality, I'm going to stress something which I am been looking into uh, very much, very closely recently, which is about the shift or uh, between the shift of grounds, I mean, um, meanings, the idea that archaeology can be performed both in the digital and in, and in the physical space. And actually, the conjunction of these two places or spaces is actually bringing important um, possibilities, offering important possibilities to the disciplines. So uh, yes, as uh, already been said, I work at Lund, uh, Lund University, and uh, uh, but also I am this um, visiting professorship at uh, the museum uh, in Oslo, the University Museums, where I'm instead working mainly with uh, um, the collection management department. Uh, I have responsibilities for the courses also in, in digital archaeology. And I am, uh, since 2015, we founded this dark lab, uh, <laughs> the Lund University Digital Archaeology Lab. Um, which uh, at the beginning it started a bit like because we were moving into um, these buildings, new building here, we call it Lux. So, and we thought that dark, the idea of being in the dark was actually very, very nice. And so we, we just uh, adopted this name, which, but it's interesting. We have uh, the lab is today, has been recognized in 2015 as a national infrastructure. And um, so um, we uh, support uh, all the field uh, work which is developed within the division, within the Department of Archaeology. Um, and of course, we host a lot of postdocs, PhD, and, and so on. But you can uh, check on the website if you're interested on our publication and activities. It's, uh... So today's presentation uh, is going to be divided, I would say, in three parts. The first part, uh, will focus on aspects connected with virtual reality as instrument used every day for interacting with the surrounding world. So I'm just, we'll try to make the point on the fact that virtual reality is not necessarily connected with your technology. It is something that you really engage with for understanding, for exploring, and actually for planning, I would say, all your life. The second part of this presentation will deal with the concept of virtual reality as a tool for supporting field practice. So then we will try to be, uh, I will try to um, focus more on uh, instead archaeology and, and to explore with you a little bit or summarize uh, a little bit how this has been used within our discipline. So basically we will try to answer what's happened when we take the virtual dimension in the field. So. The third part of the presentation is that we discuss aspects connected with the use of 3D visualization, not as a tool, but as a ground for developing research. So there has been a lot of discussion and also publication dealing with this big um, dilemma of is virtual archaeology, is digital archaeology a tool, or is a new methodological approach? So there has been a lot of, um, a lot of perspective in this. And uh, I would like to, I will try to, uh, bring my points on the fact that I believe that is getting more and more part of the ground. Um, you know, really a synergetic methods to use within our more traditional approach for getting a much broader picture of our studies. So um, I would like to start this uh, talk proposing an alternative angle of what virtual reality or the, let's say the 3D experience is outside the technological boundaries. So uh, I came across a very interesting book edited by Eric Champion titled The Phenomenology of Real and Virtual Places, uh, where a number of authors bring important perspective concerning the meaning that the impact and the value of virtual worlds in our relation, in relation to our daily life. Now, in specific, I was impressed by the article uh, titled Virtual Place and Virtualized Place. So uh, this is was written by, is written by Bruce Jans, in which among the many other things, he discussed the fact that virtuality happens when there is a sustained relation that creates something new. 
and this could happen in material space just as it could in the digital represented space. Now, Jans also discussed the fact that he becomes a problem, referring to virtual places, when we think that all we have to do is simulate the physical parameters and the patterns of actions or the behaviors in a place. And unfortunately, this is very much what we do very often within virtual archaeology. So we just record and we, we think of creating a representation. But Jans remind us that it could be much, much more. Now, since the human started overproducing information, there needs to increase the capacity to memorize grown exponentially. Now, text, of course, was an advanced method for keeping records. However, until the invention of the printing, well, this media uh, was not diffused. And for this reason, the only way of possessing knowledge was memorizing. Now, this was, and still is, a crucial aspect of the way humans produce knowledge and across the years, several methods were developed for increasing these important skills. Once again, I want to underline here the fact that a human will deal with a number of information which are far larger than what their physicality can manage, right? And the invention of text allow really keeping track of huge quantities of, of data. Memory, again, is still the only possibility of handling, reviewing, selecting all these data. Now, you would probably wondering where is it going? Well, what is this method? What is the method used by the humans to extend their memory and, of course, interact with a larger quantity of data? It's very simple. It's creating visual 3D maps. This was actually nothing new and nothing technological. Actually, this is called Lochi or memory palaces. So, where imaginary virtual locations in our mind or in your mind where we can store mnemonic images which recall or represent specific information. I mean, Simonides of, of Tsios, for example, in the sixth century BC, invented this method. Cicero, the Rhetorica de Renium, ATBC, but also Giordano Bruno, Giulio Camillo, Mark Twain. They were all uh, you know, exercising this and basically using virtual words for expanding their capacity of generating knowledge. Now, um, if this is, I think this is a very interesting um, or catching example. So, so my question is why if we do this naturally, I mean, this is really is a, is a technique that we really uh, have been using from long, long time. Why is it so difficult when actually we use technology? Why not using technology in this way instead of representing, but mainly actually for organizing and creating or identifying relation among our data, no matter the type of subject you're involved in, to actually identify new patterns. But I mean, probably a quick review of how humans have been imaging the impact of technology in our life do not always correspond to reality. And uh, for example, um, William Gibson, uh, which is you know, so the, 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 the father of the cyberpunk, I don't know, or as many other, as well as many other, discuss virtual reality in the frame of cyberpunk and describe this technological achievement as a parallel dimension, something running in parallel and not within our real life. So it's interesting, you know, it, have you ever heard about the metaverse? It is the metaphor of, uh, you know, this parallel world in the cyberspace. And it's interesting because Second Life, for example, it has been uh, inspired entirely through the metaverse, where actually you can go in a place and changing identity and so on and so on. However, um, um, I would say that this doesn't really represent a clear picture of how technology engaged with our life. I mean, think, for example, to social media. You are not isolating yourself in another parallel world. You actually use them to increase your interaction with the world. You establish relation, you construct network. It is something which goes in parallel and in synergy with your real life. So this idea of spread all along the pop culture, uh, the one which I presented before, Gibson, shaping the idea that the way to join the parallel world was mainly about connecting yourself with a different reality, a place where you could play a different game, joining a world ruled by different law, regulation, and where you could abandon why you are um, who you are 
and being someone else. Now look at these slides. It is extremely interesting. Here you have the lone mover man. I don't know how many of you, this is, it goes back in Asia here, but you know, one of the first virtual reality movies where actually this guy was going in a garage, plugging in with a lot of cables and actually entering in a completely new dimension. Throne, fantastic, you know, a movie. You know, you finish, if you could solve an, arc an arcade game, actually automatically you were projected in a fantastic new dimension and having a completely different task, life, et cetera. Well, Matrix. Matrix was in the 90s. So, you know, it was a moment where wireless did not really, um, was not so diffused. So you have to plug your computer with fiber into the, into the internet. And guess what? Any of you remember how actually Neos used to, you know, plug himself in a different, in a different, uh, in a different dimension. You know, it was really parallel. It was completely different on who he or they were in the cyber world versus who they were in the real world. And then, you know, more recently, this is player number one. Same story, you know, uh, this guy entered this parallel world. Uh, how, of course, not anymore with a cable, but with a goggle, basically with, with, a, with a one of the very similar system of what we use today. So my point here is that, you see, has not changed at all. We still have this idea that virtual reality and the digital world is a separate world. And even also this, all these, you know, images remind us of pop culture, remind us the way of how, you know, uh, we have been, you know, imaging or telling a story of this relationship between digital world and real world, I mean, is exactly the same. You only change the technology to plug yourself in. So I think this is all, I would say, um, um, to revisit or to rediscuss. Now, if we go um, instead back to the archaeological literature, for example, uh, once again, one question could be, is this happening also in archaeology? Well, after some strange experiments, and I'm referring mainly to second life in archaeology, which more than any other uh, virtual tools, again, remind the Egyptian metaverse, after a phase where virtual archaeology was mainly theorized for being uh, then used more as an illustrative tool, uh, at the very beginning of the third millennium, archaeology start considering the virtual space as a tool for discovery. Among the first, the first interesting uh, discussion concerning the virtual space in support of knowledge production, we find the work of Bernard Fischer and Anastasia Dokoweri Hill. And in specific, Fischer, in a different publication, discuss the idea of the heuristic uh, archaeology, meaning the use of, for example, game engines or 3D models for understanding rather than representing. Um, Forte, Maurizio Forte, which I think was a guest of one of the seminars in the previous year, described virtual archaeology uh, as a static and graphic oriented disciplines incapable of providing archaeologists with the tools for simulating a potential past. So by introducing cyber archaeology, Forte shifts the focus on simulation rather than visualization, describing a discipline where interpretation occur as a result of a dynamic exchange of information between users and the digital environment. Um, and now, Matt Edward, uh, is, is, I think one of my favorite in this discussion, write an interesting paper, he wrote an interesting paper titled From Spade Work to Screen Work where indeed he described the digital domain in archaeology, not just as a tool for discovering new information, but as a place of discovery. He underlines how the use of computers for modeling and visualizing archaeological data impacts, and is, I mentioned and quote him, organizational and political structure of the disciplines. He also argued that computer representation, and here he refer mainly to satellite images because he's referring to a different time, but can be used for challenging theories and ideas at the same level of tangible materials, reinforcing the idea that those have effect far behind the sphere of discovery. And this is extremely interesting because he, he is, I think, picturing what is really happening uh, every day for all of us, really engaging with technology more and more. It's not just for discovery, it's really, you know, for preparing the environment where the discovering happened and is extremely exciting. However, I would say um, in addressing the impact that digital technology 
uh, uh, this is Poseland uh, um, and the treaty regarding our having in archaeology, Poseland stressed the importance in having the 3D data as a result of a direct and non-mediated engagement with the material being recorded. All these authors underline the need to keep connection between the digital and the physical alive. And this seems to be, at least in archaeology, the only way to generate virtuality intended as a fecund and profound territory, which has the capacity of expanding the process of creation. Now, um, it is a very interesting, uh, for example, uh, Professor Giuliani, uh, already long ago in 2007, he was already writing, um, actually, um, um, uh, was already publishing text mentioning the facts in referring to digital technology, or the fact that uh, uh, archaeological documentation is not a mere document, is not an, an action of uh, um, uh, geometrical recording. It is actually our process, our way of establishing an intellectual relation with a monument. I mean, when you draw, when you are in front of the document, when, monument, when you touch it, when you grasp with your trowel, you understand it's really a cognitive process and this cannot be substituted. So that's why I think what Poseland, uh, uh, Dominic Poseland uh, stressed here is very important. I mean, every time you make 3D documentation, you know, every time you represent something, you also need to assess this in the field. Also because the quality and the affordance connected with that specific object are definitely reflected by you know, the, the, the motivation that you, or by the, 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 the method and the way of, of how you acquire those, those, uh, those, those, those records. So <clears throat> what is it here? This is Harry's matrix. So, so far we have been through a sort of skeomorphism of practice, right? Where we have been trying to replicate everything in 3D. This can be considered really innovative, honestly, in terms of archaeological practice. I mean, even though I think the skeomorphism, it is indeed a natural step for moving forward. Still, I mean, this was already theorized at the end of the 70s, the idea of, you know, thinking in deposits. So um, we need, uh, you know, to find innovation not in the application of technology, but in the development of methods which allow answering questions which were absolutely impossible to, you know, to answer before or even to formulate before. The real challenge is not using the 3D for detecting new information. This is kind of a um, normal standard to do, but for amplifying our capacity as a human beings to define new knowledge. So it is a place for thinking, a space where it's possible to take different perspective and most important to gain the grand picture. Daniel Kahneman, which was a Nobel Prize in Economy, I think 2006, with his seminal work, remind our limits as human beings in handling complexity in large data sets. We rely on technology to progress in our research. And the idea of combining the so many data coming from you know, the advanced research, in our case, archaeological science, for example, in one spot and looking at them all together, it is a big difference. Um, we are led to think that everything that has a presence in the real world can be represented to a 3D model. However, the physical world consists of elements that expand far behind their shape. So representative examples uh, in this can be identified within archaeological field practice. For example, Valente and Harris, they've been, uh, uh, for instance, they discuss the feature interfaces. And feature interfaces are crucial elements for the definition of the stratigraphic sequence, are immaterial, and for this reason, those are very complex to represent, you know, using a 3D model alone. So another example, striking example, is about, oops, sorry, is about archaeological deposits. So, which are very 3D features, which we never appreciate in three dimension, if not by sectioning or excavating them. So the only and most central part of the excavation, the most 3D part of it, we never see it because we remove it on the ongoing excavation. So you see how this idea of the 3D must be reconceptualized. I mean, it's not only the 3D of the material form which should be looked at, but actually is there also the, the 3D dimension of information which eventually are immaterial. But we will see this in a few slides. 
Now, um, in 2014, Christian Christiansen described the third science revolution in archaeology in a very seminal article. Her science entered in archaeology aggressively, but also created a huge demand in terms of interpretations. So first of all, specialists developed their approach within their subject, and we don't possess actually instruments to see these results properly contextualized in the current investigation. So when the analysis usually reach the archaeologists, usually the context is gone. Now, we as humans do not possess the capacity to handle such a huge amount of data in one vision. Think today, archaeology has completely changed. I mean, today you have in the field, you know, you can have genetic studies, you can have archaeobotany, you can have osteologists performing any type of analysis. This actually was not so common to have like a 20 years ago. So now actually a field excavator working with a, you know, called to make this sort of summary or connection with all this information, they, don't, they really don't have the, the instruments to put all these things together easily. So in this respect, the possibility to visualize all this information, different information in one space is really invaluable. And on the slide, you see big data, of course. I don't know how many of you got it, however. And this is the theoretical wheel uh, you know, from Christian Christiansen article, which suggests all these new actually elements entering you know, in archaeology and being now very um, you know, uh, important uh, within our discipline. So <clears throat> now let's move to the second part. What's, what's happened when we take the virtual dimension in the field and how does this impact our work? Well, here I can only bring my personal experience and experience, not just my experience, but the experience of my uh, colleagues. Um, and uh, okay, just admit to that. And uh, something um, interesting is that um, we actually started, uh, well, the first epiphany, let's say, in this direction. It comes, it came when we had the Swedish Pompeii project. So in this specific case, it was extremely interesting. We, we, uh, we started with um, 3D um, documentation, high resolution documentation of the insula 51 in Pompeii. We used a combination of different techniques. And this was, of course, designed or developed within the Swedish Pompeii project in Lund. It was extremely interesting because the acquisition campaign was challenging. We did it, but then what? I mean, we thought, well, you know, we, 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 we must do something with that. We, we need to start using this data in a completely different way. And so this opened for us a huge discussion. I will come back to this data set in a few slides, but, you know, I decided to use different projects to give you a sort of narrative of, all, of our, you know, <laughs> way of, of, of thinking about it. And the first thing, for example, was the process of archaeological excavation. So very often we use 3D models for representing um, for representing contexts which are very quick to go. But so then we start thinking, why don't we instead, for example, use this context for, uh, for uh, um, you know, for creating, uh, for following documentation, the documentation process. So it was very, um, it was very interesting because we thought, why don't we actually use the 3D model for adding a clear picture or representation of what we have been removed the, the year before? Why don't we use this in spatial relation with actually uh, uh, in spatial relation with all the data set collected? And most important, why don't we customize the database in order to host these 3D models and also for describing them with specific metadata and in order to record information which are absolutely not necessarily visible in our field roads. So. Also, the idea of bringing on site and in the field a sort of collections of reference collection of artifacts, which will inform field archaeologists about the possible finds in the site, it is something that we can do today. And we we actually have been uh, have been trying all this uh, um, across the years. So um, interesting uh, quote from Zubrov by referring to its capacity of including multiple representation of the archaeological investigation, uh, you know, Zubro described this field. I mean, the cyber archaeologist is referring to virtual archaeology, but as a new, as a link between scientific and interpretation and archaeology. 
this is also very interesting because these two areas has always been a bit fighting or distant from them. And actually the possibility of, for example, performing quantitative and qualitative assessment in one space eventually on site, it is really a big, uh, a big um, possibility. Now, uh, I've been uh, also working uh, at the Chattaroyuk uh, Research Project within the frame of the Chattaroyuk Research Project. It is a, a Neolithic site in Turkey, uh, which in which actually several um, experiments has been carried since the 90s, actually, for, for example, testing the reflexive theory designed by Nihan Hod. And, this was extremely interesting. And in that specific context, you have several uh, buildings, Neolithic buildings in incredible conditions, excavated, of course, uh, with single context method. And what was actually interesting is also the possibility, was the possibility of using these techniques for um, visualizing buildings in the same space, buildings which you know, belong to the same phase, but which have been excavated in a completely different times. So archaeologists could just drag and drop in the field, you know, these models together and getting pictures, picture 3D representation or simulation of what actually was, um, in a, 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 you know, a sort of um, what was, uh, um, you know, visualized combining um, context and uh, spaces which are no longer available was also used for drawing directly on the models, but also something interesting was also used by the osteologists, for example, and other specialists for creating their own georeference model. And the fact that this was very imported into a geodatabase, it was giving the possibility to anyone to reassemble the type of uh, context or simulation environment, which was more convenient for supporting or revising specific, uh, specific hypotheses. An interesting experiment, this was in 2015, was, was very interesting. Another possibility is actually re, uh, you know, like a puzzle, recombining the information. So in 2015, we were working on site and suddenly, you know, this feature, uh, feature 2S666 was found uh, in one of the most beautiful buildings, but for um, a problem of conservation and stability was quickly removed. Now, when it was removed, the eyes and the decoration, these are obsidian eyes, were not visible. So they were completely cool. So this was moved automatically to the uh, conservation lab, the, so which, in which actually the fish was clean and was, you know, was, was prepared for conservation. So, but the big question was, you know, um, we need, they need to study it actually on site in context. So the fantastic things is that uh, we had a large library of models on the GIS. And so the archaeologist found the model on the slide on your left side, where actually this feature was contained. And it was a big, you know, fantastic achievement. But the problem was, as you can see, that the layer, a clay layer, was covering the entire feature. So it was not possible to see where actually the eyes were looking at. And also because it was assessed the fact that the feature was not, uh, I mean, it was in original position. So actually it was possible to make a 3D model with photogrammetry of the features after conservation and basically re-georeferencing the, the, the features in the, in the GIS in the original position. And it was extremely interesting because it was possible to, in a sense, interpret this as a part of a larger, um, of a, a larger structures inside the house. So what I'm saying is that this technology allow you, allow you to sometime also recombine the information for eventually assessing different, different views or different ideas of uh, which, which comes, uh, which can come actually during the excavation. You know, for the whole view experience of archaeological excavation, ideas change continuously. So there is nothing uh, really, really big. Um, just mute Paolo Morella, yes. So it was, was particularly interesting. All the, all the, um, um, all the reference to these works you can find on the slides uh, have been published. So another more recent thing is the possibility of importing uh, volumes in the, in, the, in the GIS, the 3D GIS. You can 
now very easily by combining the two context interfaces. Uh, you can generate the volume per se, what we have been discussing before, and then having the volume in the geodatabase. This is an interesting thing. Um, I mean, it is not really something, um, it is something that in our experience can be very useful in specific situations. What is very important, I would say, is more the, the, the primary data, which occur here is usually the result of photogrammet or image-based modeling and laser scanning, because those are the primary data that you use for recombine. These are boundary models. So this means are basically you have only the boundary of the information and not the entire not voxel model, but it is extremely, it can be actually very useful, especially when you have very complex situation in the field to assess. And, and this is also very easy to, uh, um, nowadays to import uh, with type of technology available. So it's not only, for example, the use of, I don't know, field drawings, sometimes total station, GPS, it depends from the archeological tradition for making the drawings, but even importing actually manual drawings in it. But it is also the possibility of having a 3D surface representation models of the context, but also uh, solid models. Uh, or B models, so called, for it. We've been working a lot also with uh, osteologists, uh, and this was extremely. I always show this case. It's very, it's very uh, rewarding. I would say. Um, what we did was here we found the cold case, an homicide in the Iron Age, and uh, it was extremely interesting because the the body uh, on red was excavated, in, you know, the first year, plus the head, the second body, uh, and then you know a larger excavation was carried out. The second year. This was a collaboration developed with the Kalmar County Museums, and, and we, together with uh, me and Ellen V. Helson, which was osteologist here in Lund, we um, tried to, you know, build up this new methodology. It was extremely interesting. You know why? Because first of all, just having all this information in the GIS allow us to drag and drop in the space what we needed, and automatically the system recreated that in 3D the scene of, you know, the cold case scene. I would say plus all the artifacts and everything. This type of information is absolutely impossible to, to, you know, to gain in the field because we actually already removed the, the, the human uh, body, the first year, at least the red one. But most important, even more interesting was the fact that um, together with the land, we decided not to follow standard pro procedures or better. We did it. I mean, Elaine had all the uh, human material in Lund, and she started actually doing her evaluation of each bones. And she started, but instead of recording this in normal, you know, uh, paper sheet, we she recorded this in the three D geodatabase customized for this case study. And what was fantastic, as you can see on the top of the image, when we actually asked the geodatabase to show us post mortem fracture fractures, it came out very parallel lines probably highlighting the roof with crash on the bodies and, you know, crash the bodies in perfect line. So this was extremely interesting because um, it was showing an archaeological result, which was not possible to gain neither in the real world or even actually in lab. This was coming purely on the, on the real side. And, you know, another interesting part is that after a few years that this was published, we, was, we were uh, contacted by the homicide uh, the police uh, in, in Malmö here and so we had a meeting with several inspectors and they were very curious about this methodology for reuse this so then we have a larger meeting with the forensic police and the anti-terrorism police in Stockholm which they came in Lund and now we created this FURARC is the forensic Swedish forensic archaeology archaeology group which is a very large group which involved the collaboration between several specialists working in forensic studies and this was interesting because you know, we never guessed that you know, an approach like that can actually have an impact on also the, the you know, the society in a more larger scale. Of course, this is um, one of our master students, uh, John Howard, which um, uh, explore the use of um, archaeobotany or the visualization of archaeobotany within actually uh, archaeological uh, context. It was particularly interesting. Um, the fact that actually you can also display immaterial information and without mentioning the fact that this data could now also populate the, you know, the volumes part with the 3D models representing solids. It was extremely interesting because, you know, it provides you with a completely different pictures of the type of record that you usually, you know, uh, excavate. And the nice thing is that this can be done, this can be actually used on site. So, you know, not after months that the excavation is finished. Um, 
And this for coming back to Pompeii, I mean, what we did with that insula, well, it was great. We could actually, for example, uh, by working with the architects, he customized our 3D GIS in order to, um, for example, um, ask in the system to calculate uh, which wall was actually uh, falling or uh, was in highest risk of collapse by cross-matching information about, for example, like in this case, loss of verticality and many other elements like, you know, conservation uh, intervention, which occurred before the 60s, the 40s. And it was extremely interesting how a system designed for archaeology can actually uh, very easily be adapted or used by others. Uh, specialist, and this was this will catch a lot the attention of uh, uh, um, the time was Massimo Zanna, um, the superintendents, which uh, we we were invited in Pompeii to give a presentation of this, uh, you know, this demo. It was it was a very rewarding, but also very very interesting for us to you know to discover these these links. Let's say, uh, of course, we also did ar more archaeological um, uh, work on Pompeii, and this was interesting because this was. Uh, um, um, you know, we also made a reconstruction and we always think to reconstruction as something for the public. But in reality, what we've been using it has been um, combining the reconstruction, which was performed by the National Research Council of Italy at that time, in the BC by uh, Daniele Ferdani and Emanuele Benedrescu. And what was interesting is that we use that reconstruction as a visual, um, uh, you know, um, as a visual constraint for making analysis of visibility. So we wanted to see if I use a 3D um, you know, virtual space, where actually, for example, the frescoes, the graffiti, or political graffiti, or the frescoes are being, have been perceived in the house, and then understanding which part of the house should be considered as a public or private space, and so on. So we have been using, I mean, this technology for making also this type of assessment. And this is, um, is a 3D approach but you know the map is in 2d but i can tell you that now we can run this in a full you know volume uh, 3d volume perception which is particularly interesting another case study and this is the last one before the third part which is just few slides um is this sura for vault this is interest, extremely interesting for us because sura for var, for var was it was a closed case it was excavated in 19th century with you know arbitrary layers so which if you're not an archaeologist means just removing arbitrary like 20 up to one meter of, of soils and then just collecting the artifacts now of course this destroy entirely the stratigraphy in a sense which was, was fine I and mean, we were talking about long long ago and you know you know that the stratigraphic methods was actually used uh, you know i would say mortimer uh, wheeler was probably one of the first using it but it was kind of late uh, in time so However, what I'm saying is that uh, this excavation um, was happening into a cave in, um, in Gotland, well, in, uh, in an island close by the island of Got Gotland. And it was extremely interesting because we used legacy data. I mean, all the data produced long ago for reconstructing or for estimating the stratigraphy. So what we did was we basically 3D scanned the, the the you know the monument we imported in the 3D GIS and then we imported the drawings of uh, the um, excavator in that time and once we did it we redraw basically the stratigraphic sequence arbitrary sequence then you know uh, one of our uh, one researcher went in Stockholm and actually he went through the archive of the artifacts found for each of these layer and you know um, what what we did in the GIS, we basically tried to re-establish or re-simulating the stratigraphic sequence according with the position of the artifacts in the space. And this was for us very interesting because it seems having a sort of uh, sense, <laughs> at least, of our work. And it was possible actually to restudy or to reopening a lot of questions, which were, of course, um, in a sense, Closed already because not you know the impossibility of going through this data, uh, but but I'm showing you this because it was extremely interesting how this technology allow you to reuse a lot of legacy data produced long ago in a way that was not possible to do it before. And for this reason, what actually you can do, you can uh, you know assessing, uh, for example, archaeological data 
which are already gone or eventually are not anymore such a clear context and position. So for us, it was also a, a very interesting uh, test of using this. Um, more briefly, third part, you know, was happened when we used the, the virtual dimension as a reflexive and inclusive space. So, um, um, now, the last decade was characterized by considerable investment made in Europe and worldwide to establish data platform for promoting large-scale research and innovation in the cultural heritage sector. Also very useful, these platforms were never really designed to support deep interaction and, you know, with the digital material, neither to promote any specific new research approach. So these limits became evident during the pandemic, which of course, sadly, digital collections were no longer just reference sources, but they actually were the only available sources for making research. This situation underlined, of course, the urgent need to research strategy for the definition of digital collection as a primary tools for undertaking research and for fully supporting scholars operating on site. So in 2019, we started this project, which was very successful, especially during the pandemic, which is not just making a 3D model and publishing of a collection, but we actually been designing uh, an entire platform, platform in which we can make data creation on our own, and actually we can extract information from the models. So this means angles, for example, measurements, sections, and everything. But what is actually particularly interesting is that this platform, which was developed in collaboration also with the National Research Council of Italy and the system we used, the open source system 3D Op, allow you to, again, measuring the information, but also in green, achieving different view, changing light. And this actually allow you to see very small details, which are not visible sometimes with the colors on. But most interesting, I would say, of everything else is actually the blue part not just metadata and paradata, but you can annotate online, annotate everything. You can create um, description according with the position of the object. You can also have hotspot, where actually you can enter information from specialists. And what is most interesting, you can just download the JSON file, send it to your students and asking them to actually study the artifacts or fulfilling information, making exams, or let's say you are actually in a, in a museum and you want to take annotation of your objects, or you want to bring with you the annotation from another museum, that actually too will allow you to share your brainstorming. So the, the thing, the main concept is, um, um, we should not rest restart from scratch every time we watch an artifact. We should benefit from the knowledge generated by other people like you engaging with it. So the possibility of having a 3D platform, which allow you to extract a lot of information from the artifacts, but also to annotate your own interpretation, your emic approach, and to actually benefit from other people's annotation, like conservators, like art historians, not just archeologists, or archeologists like you, but annotating 10 years before, for us was a great achievement, was combining emic and etic within the same platform. And uh, uh, this is a, a short movie, uh, one minute. Of, uh, of how actually the collection works. So now we have 300 artifacts. We published just all our reference collection and we still have a few years for increasing and implementing this model. Moreover, this is the dynamic collection. In Oslo, we are doing exactly the same things. It's called Bifrost. And the grand plan is actually, um, you know, collecting, connecting these two tools and actually adding uh, uh, artifacts in the same virtual spot, which are, you know, physically stored in several museums and in different nations. So why this is so important? Because this is give responsibility to the museums of curating their own data, because 3D are not just documentation, are actually as being recognized in several, uh, several projects as real data, as unique data, but they can also allow you to generate your own collection. Something which I haven't told you, you can also actually through the website generate your own collection, adding it, authoring, describing it, uh, you know, increasing all this information that you see on the screen, and then sending it to yourself, to your students, to your collaborators for start brainstorming, you know, typology or many other aspects of artifacts research in a much broader scale. Um, 
yeah, you can uh, then find this, uh, that this is just a, you know, a fast, uh, uh, yeah, an accelerated movie on, of how more or less it works. And there is, of course, a publication, two publications already on. Uh, one is the one you received uh, from Professor Fisher, and another one is actually the publication in the Michelania of this digital product. And this is, you see, this is the collection. You can create your own collection. You can describe it, title it, giving credits to who did it, and then sharing it. Um, so now, last slide. Uh, this is the, the idea. Now we are creating in Scandinavia a lot of this. And the main idea uh, now is in Lund, Oslo, and Lund already has artifacts from more than two museums, three museums almost, from irony, from actually Scandinavian prehistory. And the idea is actually having those connected and interoperable soon, um, because of course, Bifrost and I mean, archaeological collections or archives, uh, you know, they in a sense complete each other. I mean, um, south of Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, they share a very similar or same cultures in, in many ways in terms of prehistory. So why actually studying it only at the national level when, when you can uh, study relation in a much broader scale? Thank you very much. This was the last slide, and um, I hope everything was clear. Otherwise, you know, just tell me and I will clarify. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, uh, Nicola, for this uh, thought-provoking, I mean, that's a, a term a bit abused, but I mean it, uh, so I mean, I should think more in the virtual, maybe. Um, so uh, many applications, many interesting thoughts, so archaeology is really um, guiding the way. So we have uh, now lots of room for questions. Uh, please uh, leave a note in the chat, everybody from, from home or wherever you are. Um, I can then give you uh, the, the voice and you unmute yourself. We have already questions prepared, uh, anticipating your presentation here in the classroom or the students from home. And we have an actual ranking also of interesting questions. Uh, so I, I would suggest we start with the questions from the students. So that's a privilege of our students today to open uh, the discussion. And uh, the winner is Samantha. Do you, can, can you come here to the front? So uh, for those who joined us later, this is a, a seminar in connection also uh, with uh, a class from our introduction to digital public humanities. And the, Technical setup is a bit complicated. We are all vaccinated, so I should put my mask on here. So, okay, so you can take it off. All right. <laughs> Sit down so everyone can, can see you. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay. um, so I did some reading on the um, study that you did um, with the first year archaeology students. Um, and just some questions that I had there. Um, it seemed that um, that the students had difficulties um, understanding and interpreting um, the artifacts online. Um, so are there any current ideas uh, to solve the issues of like when students don't know um, like the textures, like they're just unfamiliar uh, with some of these things? Like, are there any ideas like um, that you have going on to like kind of solve these issues to be able to like, if you don't have the ability to see the object at all, like in, in person, um, it would it be possible to, to overcome those? Yeah, well, for example, first of all, that article was uh, was constructed, uh, you know, before actually we, I mean, in a very early version of it. Uh, and also this test came in full COVID when we, the, the system was not yet ready. And it was, but it was extremely interesting because it provided us with a lot of indication on how to you know, progress for uh, making something like, for example, um, now one of the issues is that um, 3D scanning or photogramming or whatever, image-based modeling are so high resolution today that um, you know, an object which can be very, very small could look like so highly defined that you lose the scale. So, for example, some of the students, they actually were confusing a flake with an axe. Because, of course, if you zoom in, they look like the same. So, you know, in a sense. So what's happening is that 
for this reason, we introduce a grid. I mean, well, sorry, a step back. First of all, the, um, when it's about researchers, it's not a big deal because researchers, they in these specific things, they already come with a pre-knowledge, which in a sense supply the, the lack of cognitive, uh, cognitive uh, approach with the article. So they already know very clearly what is what. But when it's about students, especially students at the first year, it was a great test. So what we did was in the dynamic collection, now we entered a grid, a reference grid. So you know that is always, you know, the, the you can have an idea of the object, but it's not really so easy sometimes. So for example, what we were planning to do is also um, coming from suggestion from other teachers, from other universities, because, you know, during COVID many teachers has asked us if they could use this um, platform for doing their courses. And we say, yeah, sure, it's open. <laughs> so it's no problem. And for example, 3D printing it. Now, 3D printing doesn't give you the weight, which is an important cognitive aspect, but definitely give you the, the, you know, the size. So something that we have been looking into and discussing because we could very easily right now make the object downloadable eventually and you know, um, 3D printable. It's not, it's not a big deal. There are also companies that you drag, drag and drop your model and they do it for you and they send it back. But it's not so easy. There are so many legal issues sometimes. Um, so um, something new for us was actually that uh, we have been having a lot of meetings with our lawyers, I mean, Lund University lawyers for helping us in how to you know, be sure that the data were fair, were correctly shared, with the copyright was fine and everything. So. Uh, let's say there are many solutions, but not all the solution can be uh, really followed for reasons which are not necessarily connected either with you know technology or with education. But uh, it is still a new field, and um, I would say um, rather than well, you know, in our case now we will keep using this collection absolutely. Now the, the teacher were very annoyed in Swedish, very happy with that. But you know um, we are not. Of course, we are not reducing the time with a real collection. So, the, but the problem is that you never, as a student, have sufficient time for spending your hours with the collection because the time is very reduced and the artifacts are very, you know, um, fragile. So, what's happened that usually our students they have, I would say, few hours in a course for looking, and when they have this chance, it's not, you know, they have to rotate this show. So, the idea instead of you know, letting the students study the artifacts online first. And then they actually have a real interaction with the artifacts as a normal time. We believe that this uh, interaction will be much, much more qualitative. So it's basically using these artifacts, we are talking about education, eh, for um, increasing the qualitative experience of the students when studying medical culture. Then do you, I guess, just an overall um, expanding like beyond this, do you think there will ever be an opportunity for the 3D models to replace the objects altogether? Like, do you think they will we'll ever reach a point where um, you don't need the object at all and you can just like, if something gets destroyed too, like that was like in the opening, like if, if something gets destroyed, like will you ever be able to fully understand and comprehend the, um, the artifact without physically seeing it? This is a very good question. The reality, my first answer is no. I mean, any, any digital representation, uh, you know, but because the digital representation is a new object per se. So, and also because there are several information contained in the object, which are not, you know, uh, representable within the virtual and vice versa, because for example, in the virtual object, you can remove the lights and manipulating the lights, you can see decoration, which you cannot perceive really with, at least with naked eyes. And so it should not be seen with like something which substitute the other, but more as a complementary tool for, you know, for increasing our understanding of, of the medieval culture. However, your point referring to the first light is very important because sometime in archaeology, we, we just, well, not sometime, actually during the excavation, we destroy the contents, we remove the contents, the wind. So this, this phase of removing and understanding happen in a very short time. So in that specific case, having you know a, a good documentation of and it's not just a 3D representation, but also when I say good documentation, I also mean a documentation which is well described and well uh, properly um, um, stored in a geodatabase. In this case, will definitely allow you to um, keep 
running research or re-examining research uh, in, uh, in, uh, in a better way than not having it, in a sense. So, but it's, it, is, it is a very good question. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's, it's important to put this in uh, and thought about it. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Samantha. Uh, the, we have more questions here uh, in in the reserve and uh, very, uh, further very good questions. But now uh, I, I would like to open also the room to participants from uh, outside this uh, classroom and from the seminar. So please make a note, comment in the in the chat, and yeah, post your questions. Otherwise, oh, here there is Federico. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's yeah, of course. So first of all, uh, thank you, Nicola, for the inspiring presentation. Very interesting. So, I will, yeah, of course, use part of your suggestions to improve my courses. And I have a question about the last part uh, about this 3D platform that I was not aware about. Uh, this project that you are carrying out is absolutely very interesting. And I wanted to ask uh, uh, if you are thinking uh, or if there is a possibility to include also other kind of 3D data. Of course, I'm thinking about, you know, uh, um, micro CT data in order to have the opportunity to study not only, of course, the, the surface of the object, but also, you know, the inner structure of, of, a, of the same object. If you are, if you already have, have uh, thought about, about this possibility, what do you think is something that you think is technically feasible? Because, you know, micro CT data are very heavy. Uh, so, of course, uh, uh, this can create, uh, I guess, some, some technical problems. Yeah, I mean, so, so far we have, and actually I'm sharing now in the chat this um, page. Uh, this is the, you know, this is what we have in the Dark Lab website at the moment. And we so far we have been using this approach for publishing uh, excavations, monuments, and artifacts. For example, in the excavation we have the Foro Romano underground. So we have been so we have been using in a, in a different ways. However, your question is it's uh, extremely important and interesting. Uh, we haven't yet uh, you know implemented such a type of data sets, but um, this is very a, a technical question in a sense because we, for example, um, when you have a volume three D volumes. What you can do is classifying the specific, you know, voxels, I would say groups, and then exporting, for example, uh, boundary models of that specific elements. Those can be visualized, for example. So if you have, let's say, an object and which contain three different type of elements, which you want to, you know, then, you know, you need to export from the software the boundary model, the boundary visualization and so on. Otherwise, you need to use different type of softwares which already deal with, uh, you know, which are more familiar with CD scans, for example, or these things. Now, uh, for us, it's a very important question. So, I mean, in some case, I would say it's not really necessary um, because, you know, um, we know that, for example, stone, uh, stone artifacts, you know, we are not expecting surprises on, uh, you know, except for the geological uh, information. But, for example, urns, Funerarian hearse, we have been using a lot of CT scans now uh, for analyzing the material. And the, the, uh, the, the results are remarkable. I mean, you can really, so if you have like a group of objects that could be um, you know, acquired and analyzed with this method and then published, uh, this is something that we are really looking into now because the, but you need to have a very specific group of artifacts. So our strategy will be, we will keep publishing in this way. And then uh, uh, we will also look into alternatives. But again, it's not a typology of acquisition, as you well know, that now is applied in a large scale. It's, it's very much used uh, micro CD scan or CD scan for very specific objects where you really need to extract information, which are, let's say, key for solving archeological questions and so on. But I do not exclude this. This will uh, will be will happen more and more. And I think a good practice could be look at different disciplines where instead CT scans. And I'm talking about medical, for example, institutes where CT scans are stored, uh, but are not yet uh, you know visualized. The issue there is that the the privacy policy will never allow to display data 
from human beings in the same way we do for collection. But I mean, it's it's. Uh, I know that uh, this is going to happen sooner or later, at least in archaeology, and we need to get ready. Absolutely, but it's a very very good question, and I believe that's really volumetric visualization is another big frontier, at least reading at the latest publication what you can do with it now uh, it's especially micro scan it's uh, it's very exciting yes yeah because i was thinking also about uh, you know wooden objects for example now we are trying to do virtual uh, dendrochronology so Absolutely. you can have a lot of techno important inf uh, technological Absolutely. information so perhaps in the future uh, no, we for example, have the opportunity to collaborate yeah. on, on, on for example dendrochronology would be perfect because you, you can basically you don't need to you know destroy the, the sample or reuse the sample and you can really uh you know enhance the view of it so but you see these are very specific uh, archives in a sense uh, but it doesn't mean doesn't mean that we should not look into it it is actually again i think is the is one of the future directions which uh, will characterize a lot of archaeological digital archaeology studies actually okay just the last thing i don't want to waste time um, is about uh, you, you told me just want to be sure that uh, is this platform open so yeah 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 it's, it's called a 3d op and you can uh, download it and uh, it's, it's developed actually by the uh, national research uh, national research council of uh, italy in pisa uh, is the ist um, and uh, the, the visual computing lab is the one the, we have a, we have a, we have a formal collaboration with them since many years and um, uh, this is actually used a lot, this platform, not just for you know, by us, actually, it's used by many other archives and uh, for making visualization of the monuments, artifacts, and it's a, it's a really good platform because it allows you to display very high resolution models in on the web, it's very stable, and uh, you can completely customize it. So this means that, for example, if you're looking at the link which I sent you, the monuments, you know, are customized in, in the, the the interface in a very different way from the artifacts because there are different needs in terms of interaction with different models. So yes, absolutely. I mean, it is also Sketchfab, but to be very honest, it's, uh, it's I don't see it as a, as a good practice for making a curation because you basically don't take care of your own data. So these are uploaded in, in, in the server and then, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic tool. I don't, for, advertising or for showing displaying the work but i think in archaeology or for collection should not cannot be really i cannot see how this can be taken in, in, into consideration but still um, depends also on the development of, <laughs> of that company but i'm, I'm very much for curating your own data actually so um, yeah thank you more questions we have one questions a uh, question from ilaria that interests a couple of students here and it also interests myself Is ilaria here in the class oh, yeah. Ilaria. okay yeah please come in. um good afternoon so i had a bunch of questions actually and the one that was voted the most um, regarding the relationship since you feel like um, somehow innovative in your uh, approach and uh, pioneering in, in your activity. I was wondering uh, what the relation was with the, let's say, old academia. So the classic um, academia, the classic approach to archaeology, if it's seen as complementary as uh, a useful tool or other something that can somehow um, prevail over the old studies? So, yeah, it's a good question. Actually, um, I can say that um, I've been discussing this and showing this uh, not just uh, in Sweden or in Scandinavia, where we had, of course, very strong uh, positive feedback, but also actually many other universities spanning from different uh, uh, parts of the world. And to be honest, it's always been uh, seen as a, as a very good um, solution. Now, um, this also increased a lot after COVID or during the COVID, because I think many people realized that, you know, these tools can really be useful. And also, um, now this could be my impression, but the fact that I am an archaeologist, I mean, fully trained archaeologist, this helped a lot. 
because you know, in a sense, um, we are often very often are get this solution uh, from you know more technical uh, profiles, which is nothing wrong. Absolutely, it's 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 important to to collaborate, but obviously, um, in order to um, you know develop a deep interaction, you need to also understand what is the type of study which needs to be done with that specific artifact. So in our, in my case, being an archaeologist, communicating with archaeologists, this facilitates a lot. This is valid for all the humanities, of course. I mean, uh, uh, but I think humanities has an important role now. I mean, really now uh, in relation to, to technology, because it is a moment where we are getting a little bit more of, uh, I would say, um, powers on our own tools. And we are finally capable of, you know, shaping, manipulating, and changing these tools for serving not just a nice visualization system, but for serving research questions. You know, I mean, um, all the academics, they actually have a lot of experience. So, and the, the, the methods which has been um, developed, which which we learn, I learn as, as, as in my generation, or they learn, uh, it is in any case very solid in many senses. It's been, it went through a lot of intellectual discussion. So I think uh, in the very same moment, we start using these tools intellectually. So in the very same moment, we start criticizing this tool in a constructive way. We we build up an intellectual an intellectual discussion about the effect and impacts of these tools in our work. That would be never a problem. The problem is then when we go in and say, you know, what we did was, was rubbish, and this is the future, and this is how we should go. It's it's wrong. This is not the way, and this is not true. So I think um, my experience has been very positive, but after COVID, it was even more positive, of course, because the, it was. I think it was a general understanding of the fact that. Uh, these tools are not just this one, but in general, technology can be used by us for doing much, much more than what we were doing before. So, thank you very much. May I? Yeah, I okay, hope yeah. I'm not stealing anybody else's time. No, um, I, I was fascinated by Postland, uh, say, reasoning, and I wonder if you could maybe tell us more about it, about the sort of relationship, cognitive relationship with the monument. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, well, um, I would say the discussion went through, uh, yeah. uh, there's this very nice book, um, The Three Dimensional Archaeology, it's a collection of articles, uh, uh, and um, I like very much, among many other, Postland, because he, uh, Dominic Postland, is a field archaeologist with a very long experience on digital archaeology, this we're talking about since the 70s and so on, and uh, and he has a very genuine, genuine way, I believe, in my opinion, of, of using um, a very, very effective, genuine, constructive way of engaging with technology. Because, you know, he realized the point that, you know, you cannot just think of going there, making a bunch of pictures and having a 3D model of the excavation sitting on a corner of the trench, and then, you know, then you have it. It doesn't work like that. I mean, if you are an archaeologist, you well know that you need to excavate, you need to engage with the ground, you need to, for example, the... The, the, the texture, the, the context uh, is usually um, identified not just because the shape of the color, but also for the consistency at the trout's edge. So um, there is a lot of literature, very interesting literature from a more theoretical aspect. For example, Ian Hodder discussed the trout's edge and the reflexive methods, the way that the, the, the interpretation constantly change, you know, during the excavation. I mean, these methods need to be incorporated in our daily activities. And also Giuliani, I have to be you know, honest, Caroli Fulvio Giuliani, he wrote in a book of, um, actually this was the forward of a book published by Bianchini, I think. Uh, I have it here somewhere, yes, I wanted to read directly from his text, but however, um, is extremely interesting because he already in 2007, but this means that this, you know, he thought about this much earlier. He said that, you know, you should not think that archaeological documentation is just a mere operation of recording. He said it is an intellectual relation. It is, you know, it is a way of establishing an intellectual relation with the monument. How many, how many of you 
if you are an archaeologist has been looking at the monument and drawing it, you need to touch it, you need to measure it, you need to do a lot of cognitive operation, which will make your 3D models much better. So this, I can tell you, is one of the biggest challenges in our courses in digital archaeology. We use a lot of theory, we use a lot of this example, because we don't want to have archaeologists going out, you know, in the field and not touching the field. We want to be sure that you know they engage with the field and they are capable of using these technologies in perfect, let's say, harmony with their you know field experience. And this is one of the most difficult, uh, challenging, I would say. But um, also, Chad, you, if I can just <laughs> build up on this, I remember with James Taylor uh, and many others, we did a lot of experiments from Uni University of York about this, and it was noticing that you know when tablet and 3D came in the field. Many archaeologists were sitting on the corner of the edge drawings. And this was a problem. So, you know, you need to be disciplined. You need to decide not to do it. You need to, you know, engage with the field, uh, not getting lazy in a sense, but it's not just laziness. It's just, you know, lack of um, uh, communication with the physical space. And this is very core of my presentation. I hope this was very evident because um, I really want to stress the fact that the, the new ground of discovery is not in the physical and is not in the virtual, is in the movement, constant movement between the digital and the virtual. Think to your own relation with the people you live or you meet every day. You know, you send a WhatsApp message for setting a place. You know, you choose the place using, you know, a, a website for, you know, a trip advisor for checking if it was good, to read the relation, and then you meet the person and then you evaluate if what you had was a good experience and then you report it. In the digital part. So you see how this is happening together. And it's the same in archaeology, I think. We do this in humanities, we do this in not in one place, not in another, but just moving from one to another. That is it's that is my I could be wrong eh? very much, but you know, <laughs> you never know. That was my impression. Thank you very much. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Ilaria. Uh, more questions on TripAdvisor or other platforms. There is a question from Alessio. Who is at home, I guess. Who is at home? So please uh, put yourself on unmute. There, there, there we are. Uh, please. So, um, one, uh, how can uh, digital archaeology help uh, archaeology? You mean in, in general? And yeah, in general. Well, I mean, it's, um, um, well, it is, it is an interesting question because um, um, I could answer with another question. When is that an archaeologist doesn't really use digital archaeology nowadays? So you can decide to do it. Like, for example, okay, now I'm going to use this technique because I, I want to investigate that. But, um, but you can also, um, in reality, um, I'm searching for an interesting article about that. But you can also, in reality, just ignore it and practice in archaeology. You will discover that a lot of the things that you do in your you know, professional activities as an archaeologist or as, I would say, anyone in humanities is very much uh, you know, characterized by a lot of... Uh, uh, digital tools more than what we think. Um, you know, I think uh, Alessio, if I may, uh, um, I think we are in different generations. Unfortunately for me, because I'm, uh, and you know, I am very much in between the the two generations. I mean, and I got internet when I was twenty one years old, right? So the first internet. I still remember the sound of the modern, like I don't know how many of you experienced that. Probably you were, in a sense, digital poor. I mean, you, you know, you probably, I assume, you know, were in a generation where, you know, this was already around. So the question is the same for archaeology. Uh, I have seen this shift, absolutely. Uh, even though I actually start practicing archaeology professionally when I was already, you know, I would say 20, 24, 23, 25, probably, and this was already happening. But um, yeah, the reverse question is. How many archaeologists can say you're practicing archaeologists without using 
digital tools or digital archaeology? I don't know. Uh, I know it's not really an answer, and answering with an answer is never polite, but uh, please accept this, <laughs> uh, this reply, because it's the only thing I can offer. It was, it's a complex question, which I will definitely think more thorough in the future. But yeah, there is another interesting uh, article. There is a book called the Digital Archaeology Bridging Methods and Theory. And here it is by uh, Evans and Daly. And uh, they actually um, opened the book discussing a little bit of what you just asked. So I will send you the reference if you like. It's, uh, but it's, yeah, it's this one. It's edited by, uh, I think, Rutledge, yes. And uh, you will find this, some of interesting things uh, in the very first part in the introduction. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is a live question from the classroom. Do you yeah, have another follow-up. Um, yeah. Do you want me to come up as well? Yeah, please. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, in the meantime, I can just make a comment on the textual scholarship, digital textual scholarship, where the situation is slightly different, where you can still do uh, literary studies and uh, research on uh, literature and um, text ignoring uh, digital tools, except for Word maybe, so for your Word processor. But um, yeah, we will have, uh, this is an announcement in November, um, um, uh, a two days uh, um, symposium on, on a digital Dante scholarship. And then we will reassess and evaluate what has been achieved in scholarship, so in digital Dante scholarship, because there's a lot of uh, opposition uh, who says, in the end, there is not very much achieved with digital tools, which I would, would always object. But uh, so everyone who is interested in this uh, uh, conflict or in this development in textual scholarship, especially focusing on, on Dante scholarship, is very much invited to participate in November. I think it's a 15, 16, Monday, Tuesday, two afternoons here in Venice and online. So, but uh, yeah, Samantha. I'm back. <laughs> um, just you, you keep talking about how like today, like archaeology, it's very digital. Uh, but is there anyone that's kind of against that? Any sites or museums or whatnot that is still old school and like they don't want these technologies in, um, in their places? In general, like any backlash? Probably. <laughs> Probably yes. I don't know. Um, have you, have you, so you haven't you haven't experienced really like anyone that's like against this or they they have like some apprehension like, uh, with it. Well, I mean, it's what I do when when I encounter uh, you know someone with a different uh, opinion. I I like to ask why. And of course, to be honest, um, when uh, motivation has been posed, I found all the motivation posed very reasonable. So uh, it's not really being against or pro, it's actually um, posing a, a critic about it. For example, I give you an example. I was reading a paper, I uh, was reviewing a paper, and this paper was about against the, the you know, the, um, the heavy towers of academics, which keep the 3D model by themselves, and no one can do it. It was about citizen science and these things. Um, and for example, I, I found some time, uh, you know, in line with, with people which criticize instead, for example, a diffuse approach of technology to everyone just because it's easy to do 3D models. Now, when you when you are excavating, as we discussed before, you destroy information very often, or you know, a 3D model which is badly done can be very misleading. I mean, people who just think, oh, this is how it was, and then they use it, and then it was badly done. It looked like great. But in reality, it doesn't. So, um, so sometimes, for example, I find myself disagreeing with you know concept of very advanced, let's say, or progressive way of digitizing, or we will digitize the world and so on, because it is important to understand that you know you need to have professionals or people which know what they are doing when actually you are documenting something. There are also other aspects. Um, uh, which I, for example, found myself very uh, in line with when they criticize the diffusion of 
you know, recording 360 degrees. I mean, we should never forget that we have been colonizing the world culturally, uh, actually, and also from materiality. And sometimes, for example, having concepts like, oh, we'll use this technology for recording things, otherwise they're going to destroy it. It's very offensive. And I also think that before doing it, we need to, you know, spend a lot of um, thought on how this can be done properly. And most important, how we should, we cannot repeat the same mistake done already with, when we engage with material culture. I mean, we should never forget that, you know, if you're acquiring through this something properly, and then, you know, you just leave, and then that monument gets destroyed for a reason or another. I mean, you are actually holding knowledge about it, uh, which eventually um, is not necessarily open to, you know, to the community where this object has been, uh, which, which allow, eventually allow, you to, allow uh, grant you to, to do this. So what I'm saying is that, uh, uh, yes, for sure there are people which are against, but I really recommend to listen to people that are against. I mean, when they have reasonable discussion, because eventually they've been looking into, they've been taking into account aspects which are equally important. Like, for example, again, colonizing, using this for colonization, or using these unethically, or eventually, you know, um, contrasting phenomena or of world global globalization, which do not really follow any. Uh, you know, guidelines, meanings cannot be reused or reused in science. So, so this is my, so that's, yes, of course, I phone people with a lot of critiques, but again, I, to be honest, um, every time that I listen to them, um, I phone sometimes extremely reasonable, uh, you know, uh, objections. And uh, when was possible, I try to keep them very clear in my mind for, you know, see if I could consider those in my project. But yeah, I, but I don't know if, <laughs> how many in the world are against this. Um, so overall, it's just, a, it's optimistic, like it's an optimistic outlook on bringing uh, the digital technologies to archaeology. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it, in my impression, but but remember I, when I started studying my PhD, there was, I had a lot of, um, I remember discussions. Well, before, actually, when I was a master's student, we were talking about three, four million years ago. And uh, a lot of discussion with people say this will never work or you're just wasting your time and all these kind of things. But, you know, if you believe in something, you just, you just, you just go on. I mean, uh, uh, if you think that this something can have an impact um, and you have a good thought about it, do it. So, um, I mean, in my case, it was positive, of course. But, you know, I think now it's more easy, it's more well accepted. Yeah. By the way, these people that's worth criticizing a lot 25 years ago now sometimes they ask for collaboration so <laughs> awesome. thank you very much <laughs> thank you i can confirm this for my career so uh, my struggles with traditionalists and scholarly editing and so yeah that brought me here to venice and you to lund uh, more questions <laughs> Um, we reached uh, half past six, but I think we have place for you know, one or two more questions. If I look at my list of prepared questions, there's, uh, I think, Jada and David have interesting questions. Who, who first? Yes. Yeah, yeah, come. That was a surprise for you who's coming. Hi everyone. So actually recently I was reading about virtual worlds in general with a lot of examples on video games and I was curious if you had any opinion on virtual, virtual visualization connected with video games because for example when I looked at the home page of Dark Lab with the YouTube video and the Pompeii visualization, it totally looked like some second life uh, thing to me, you know? So I wanted to ask the relationship, uh, if there's any, actually. So I love video games. And, uh, you know, before COVID, we had the, the artistic director here in Lund of uh, um, Assassin's Creed Odyssey presenting their marvelous work. It was a fantastic seminar with 
hundreds of people flying here from all over. I was very happy. But you know, um, it is very interesting because it's a business which take into account elements which are very, very developed. I mean, they went through, for example, incredible work of, um, uh, you know, um, research. Actually, there was uh, the artistic director and the archaeologist in charge of the reconstructions or for supervising, let's say, the reconstruction. And we were all impressed by the incredible work done. However, when it's about the game, it's not just about the reconstructions or the quality of the reconstructions. I, I want to pose you an example. If you take someone which absolutely not interest in architecture, archaeology, or whatever, and you place this person in a real place, I mean, in real you know, constructions, which is not just fully reconstructed, it's original. And then you ask this person to perform some task in going around. And after that, you assess what has been the knowledge about the site. I mean, it doesn't mean that this person will know more about it, right? So saying that, I'm not saying that video games are not you know, useful, absolutely. But uh, like, I could be wrong, so especially if you're recording, I think Katrina Cooper wrote about the fact that we should take back the narratives in the games. So meaning that it is, when it's about game, my impression is that it is about the narrative. The movies you've seen in Dark Lab, they were developed with Unity 3D, which is a game engine, but actually we are using it for a completely different purpose. We are using it with eye tracking in order to record and create heat maps and record um, where exactly, because this eye tracking and, and immersive visualization, exactly the researchers are looking at in the house. This is a research developed by Giacomo Landeschi and Danilo Marco Campanaro. And then we use this in the 3D GIS for making a quantitative and a qualitative analysis of you know, the way of how different users assess frescoes. So it is not really how it looks like much, but it's more about you know, the setting and experiments. But still, it is extremely interesting. Uh, Leiden, for example, has a very good research line on it, on games. Uh, they use also a lot of, um, 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 oh my God, my kids work placed every day to that. Uh, is Microsoft, um, Minecraft, yes, for example. And it's interesting, a lot of new dynamics. Now, something which I don't really like is when you combine a video game in a museum because it makes no sense for me meaning that it is kind of clear that you have, you know, to, to start learning how to use a video game, it takes up to 20 minutes. And it's, a, it's like a book, it's a, it's a one-way experience. You don't interact with, with the surrounding world. So, but, so, and I'm mentioning this because in the past, there's been a lot of discussion about combining this and that. But I believe the video games is a chapter per se, and it should be much more underlooked because the, as if I'm not wrong, I could be wrong, but I think it was Katrina Cooper who's, who said about to take back the narratives. If I think this is something that we need to start investing in doing. Also, I'm not an expert in video games and in, in archaeology, I mean, except for the prediction part, but <laughs> the player, but I haven't studied closely this phenomenon. So take this answer as, as a superficial answer, but I hope it was useful for, uh, you know, for further progressing with your thought on it. It was. Thank you very much. Okay. Java coming? <laughs> hi. Um, hi. So I was curious about how we can use all these uh, 3D models and tools to interact better with like visitors of museums, like if they can be useful or if they might be a little bit confusing, because as you said with your students, uh, for them it was a little bit confusing since they weren't really like experts or they were beginning to look into that field. So do you think it would be useful, for example, to have like maybe you have a fragmented M4 in the museum and you use the model, 3D model about we would be like you would look back in the past or it would be confusing. No, it would not. And it would not be new. 
Okay. Uh, you know, the, no, meaning that I'm not talking about technology here. You know, um, since the uh, 18th century, um, the idea of making physical models, yeah, right, of monuments and or reconstructed monuments or many things, it was very very good practice. And it was not just for the public; it was really for um, you know there were, I mean, for example, if you take the the model of Felicia Padiglione in Pompeii, you know, this one to one hundred, it's all many others uh, reconstructions that, you know, some of the models were actually representing the, mod the monuments as it looks like at the moment of the construction of the model, some others were interpretation. So my point is, um, it is very useful. I mean, it can be used for, um, you know, for many purposes. Also, you know, for example, in Amsterdam, they're using a lot of augmented reality in the museums and so on. But still, I believe it's the story that really matters. Um, you can impress people with no technology and you can boring people with all the tools available on the world. For example, the so-called wow effect, they have to them with someone say, oh, this is fantastic. And then after five minutes, like, it was like there is no purpose. For example, immersive system, I've seen a lot of um, very nice reconstruction where you can walk in a reconstructed Pompeian house. Yeah, that's great, but also very boring. I mean, you can do it in Pompeii in a very looking like reconstructed house and having a much better experience. So what I'm saying is that, well, in my impression is that what we search very often is more the interaction or the narrative. And then if you can use technology for supporting a good narrative, a narrative which is capable of intriguing the visitors, but also on transferring knowledge or, you know, making them more curious, then, you know, you have it. Uh, I don't think, I mean, they are, users nowadays, they're very used to, um, to technology. They all have, uh, you know, apps, uh, mobile phone, and they, they also even know better than us sometimes how to use immersive system because they have it with the PlayStation at home. But, you know, the question is, do we know how to build a narrative for all this purpose? Because actually when I met these guys from Ubisoft, you know, from Assassin's Creed, they knew it very well. And it was not just about reconstruction, it was about engaging people and letting people live in an experience which they're going to remember. So, but of course, it's not their job, you know, uh, transmit, transferring knowledge because it's a different purpose. This is actually should, supposed to be our job. So I think in a critical way, we should, I would say, take back the, the narratives, the power of the narratives, because those are really powerful things which we use since you know, our cognitive revolution as a human beings. Thank you. Thank you, Jada. So, Nicola, we squeezed you like an orange. And uh, so thank you very, very much for this engaging, uh, inspiring talk and the very good discussions. Um, thank you. I think we should close today for today. We hope to have you back some day in presence here so we can have an aperitivo or more and uh, a seminar. So the interest is great. Uh, yeah, and so uh, make, make, your, make your data and visualization talk. So the narrative is something. So when I'm looking at archaeological uh, artifacts, I always want to see them talking. So that's, I think to bring in so the public and um, uh, ignorant people like me who don't know from uh, archeology, span that is, uh, is, I think could be worthwhile because it's really fascinating material. Um, Thank you for having me here. It was a great, interesting uh, discussion. And I bring in, I'm actually bringing not because I'm already here, but I bring in here virtually a lot of uh, angles which I haven't thought before so thank you so much thank you it was a pleasure to have you as our guest and thank you to the students and the um, participants from from home and elsewhere uh, our next seminar is in two weeks and I have to look up the title and the persons <laughs> because it's no it's a, a group uh, of colleagues so Sorry for this. So the next seminar is on uh, again Wednesday at uh, five o'clock afternoon Venetian time, twenty of, of October. Rita Bernini, Jose Maria Luzon, and Maria Cristina Missiti. 
uh, and they will talk about resource tools and new changes, uh, um, the chances of digital humanities for cultural heritage, uh, academia and calcographica uh, database, the calcographica database. Uh, thank you very much. Have a good evening and yeah, see you in two weeks. The students will meet in on Monday and uh, we look forward to this. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Elena Alessandra for the work in the back to make everything so smoothly. That's uh, wonderful. Thank you very much.